right, let's turn to John chapter 1, verse 14. What I want to do now in this class is a couple of things. One is I'm going to be repeating some of what we covered early on, okay? And that relates to um, Moses' tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle representing in true in truth and in spirit, what did Moses' tra- tabernacle represent? The incarnation of Christ. Thank you. Did you all know that or did you just shock? Because I say that. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to take a good look at a couple of places in John and we're going to see that Jesus walked as the tabernacle of Moses, the fulfillment of it, the true meaning of the tabernacle of Moses. <clears throat> then we also have on the other extreme oops, uh, Solomon's temple. And that's represented by the church, us. <clears throat> All right. So we have these two main points in the Bible and in our teaching that we've covered up to this point. That, the, that Moses' tabernacle was nothing but a picture of Jesus in his incarnation. And, <clears throat> and all that happened in relationship to that. And that... Solomon's temple represents and is a picture to come of the church, the body of Christ, us, as we allow Christ to live within us. <clears throat> All right. So in John chapter 1, verse 14, and, we, and again, I'm going to recover a bunch of what we've said before. <clears throat> However, I'm going to do it in light of this stuff actually being fulfilled by Christ right here. In John. Okay. So we're going to be confronted like the disciples were confronted with this reality. Because the disciples, they were just Jews. This was history. This Moses, this time, this son. It was all history to them. But they are about to be confronted with the actual reality of what it is. And because they don't, they don't know Jesus is all of that, they only know the history of it, they're going to be confused. Okay. But... Christ is the fulfillment of all of these things. <clears throat> all right. So verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, <clears throat> and we discuss that, um, that he dwelt among us literally in the Greek means he tabernacled among us. Jesus tabernacled among us because he was the representation of the true tabernacle. He, and, and we've discussed this, but he was the only one who really had God inside of him and he lived as a temple for God. He lived as a habitation for God. I mean, he's the only one who really, really lived that, okay? And so now the time, the fullness of time has come, the time to be able to see no longer in shadow form, in a glass darkly, but now we're, gonna, we're going to visit the truth of God in the person of Jesus Christ. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do a lot of reading just because we're, we've got a lot to cover, and this is supposed to be like one class here. <clears throat> um, but, I wanna, I, but most of you who were in the earlier classes this will confirm and reaffirm what we've already said. For those of you who haven't been in here, it'll catch you up, okay? <clears throat> All right. When Jesus was incarnated, he took upon him an earthly body. And so John 1.14 says, the word was made flesh and he tabernacled ama- among us. But um, <clears throat> uh, the Greek, let's see, I already covered that. We find that God, b- before God ever established the temple, he set up the tabernacle. Okay, okay, here it is. Before he set up the church, he set up the tabernacle. Before he set up the temple, he set up the tabernacle. 
And Jesus was the tabernacle of God, the true and real, actual tabernacle of God. All right? And all of that is in perfect accord with how God did it in the historical progression of the house of God. <clears throat> all right. So, Jesus in his incarnation represented the tabernacle, but in resurrection, he is given a new body called the temple. We are the body of Christ and the temple of God. All right, let's go over to John 14 now, John chapter 14. And this whole chapter, this whole chapter is primarily dealing with, and this is very important that you get this, this whole chapter of John 14 is primarily dealing with Jesus as the tabernacle of God, but introducing them to the reality that there's going to be shortly a temple of God that's greater than the tabernacle. Okay, you following me? Okay, good. Um, Jesus, uh, John 14. <clears throat> Let me just read a few things before I say something here. Maybe, nah, let's read the scriptures here. Ver beginning with verse 7. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been such a long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. <clears throat> All right. Jesus in his earthly ministry walked as the tabernacle of God, meaning the tabernacle of the Father. Amen? <clears throat> you find this discussion in John 14. There Jesus speaks of the Father. The Lord, speaking as the tabernacle of God, tells them, in, uh, tells them that in being introduced to the tabernacle of God, one cannot help but come into contact with the living God who resides within. He's the tabernacle of God. And if you're going to meet the tabernacle of God, you got, then you're meeting God because he dwells in the tabernacle. And he's that tabernacle, okay? <clears throat> and he's speaking. And now, one thing you have to understand, he's speaking as the tabernacle of God. This is no joke. He knows he's the fulfillment of that true thing. And he's talking to them as the tabernacle of God, and they're not getting it. <clears throat> um, so uh, not, not seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of the tabernacle or understanding the basis upon which Christ functioned, Philip asked the tabernacle himself to show them the Father, presuming that they have not yet met or seen him. But everything that came out of Jesus was the Father. And he says that right here. He says that, you know, and you haven't seen him. And then he begins to say that the works that came out of me, and we'll get into all of this, but I'm, I'm just trying to get a little intro, was the Father. He's saying, you've seen him. And in fact, his wording right here is, um, show us the Father and, and it'll suffice us. And Jesus says, um, uh, well, verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my Father. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And... Philip is saying, I haven't seen him. I don't know him. And Jesus is saying, yes, you have. I'm just a tabernacle. But he doesn't do it in that spirit. But nonetheless, that's what he says. <laughs> and he is expressing that, that uh, everything that's coming out of him, in other words, he is the true, true. Because everything that's coming out of him is the Father. He's the tabernacle of God, the actual true manifestation of it. And he's telling him, you, and from henceforth you've seen him and you know him. And Philip goes, well, henceforth, no, I don't know him. <laughs> and he's saying, that's because you don't know me as the tabernacle of God. You think, and, and I'll get into that here somewhere, but I'll, I'll read that in just a second. <clears throat> um, so Jesus was, was 
response is one of shock. Could it be that even his own disciples simply see Jesus as a man starting a new religion instead of walking as the fulfillment of all that had been a shadow in the Old Testament? Could it be that Christians today only see Jesus as a man starting a new religion and never see him as the fulfillment of everything that went before? Yes, it could be. <laughs> that actually could be the case. <clears throat> All right. The Lord's response is, Have I been so long with you, and hast thou not known me? He, hath, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Remember how we noted in John 1.14 that he dwelt among us. Remember? We read that, John 1.14. The word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us. <clears throat> well, that's... You know, that was when the tabernacle appeared. God was in heaven. Abraham and everybody did this. They looked to heaven and everything. They didn't look in the earth for God. He was always in heaven until the tabernacle was given to the people of God. And then God's dwelling among us. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so that's why that wording is there. And he dwelt among us. Well, in the Old Testament, when God came to dwell permanently among them, he did so by means of the tabernacle. And here we have God dwelling among them, but Jesus is saying the God that's dwelling among them is the Father. I'm just the tabernacle of the Father. Okay? Um, before that time, before the tabernacle, before that time, God would appear and interject himself into the affairs of men from time to time. The introduction of the tabernacle represented a major shift as to how God would be known and related by men. They would know him as the tabernacle. And, and when Israel put the tabernacle in the center, that was Christ. But in Christ was God the Father. Okay, That's all that, every ounce of all of that affair and all of that stuff it's just shadows. It never meant anything compared to Christ being the fulfillment of all of that. <clears throat> all right. Um, <clears throat> this all came about because of God's desire to dwell among us. Right? God had a desire to dwell among us. Back in the Old Testament, he initiated the tabernacle. In the New Testament, he came as the tabernacle. God wants to dwell among you, I'm bringing him. I'll become a man, I'll become incarnated, but I'll become a, a tabernacle too for the very life of God so that what? So that he'll dwell among us instead of far away anymore. <clears throat> um, let's see. <clears throat> this all came about because of God's desire to dwell among us. You must also recall that that particular phrase denotes a special way God is presenting to us how he will dwell among us. That phrase is translated, he tabernacled among us. He, it's the same words. It, the, the King James translated it, he dwelt among us. Well, he did dwell among us, but he dwelt among us by the actual Greek word, he tabernacled among us. You get it? It's the actual tabernacle of God is how he wants to do it. In other words, God doesn't just want to be a spiritual, you know, apparition appearing and going, okay, you know, I'm among you. And, ah, you know, and then he disappears again and goes away. Ah, you know, well, you never, you know, I, I remember when I first got saved, somebody said, well, you never know what God's going to do. God works in mysterious ways. And I'm going, you know, I, I think God's a little, he wants us to know his ways. He doesn't just want to go, you know, and do some mysterious thing. We go, oh, he's God, you know. That's kind of, I mean, that's, it's like a, never mind. <clears throat> uh, all right, so, uh, this is all very important to our context in John 14. Here he is presenting himself as the tabernacle of God and the fulfilling of it. He is also presenting a shift in relating to his people that is every bit as radical as the shadow shift that was presented to Israel at the introduction of the tabernacle in the wilderness. So you, 
Some of you, we, we went over this, but what a radical shift when God, Abraham, and all that came after him, and all that were before him, Noah and all them, they just sort of, you know, God was in heaven, and they offered anywhere they want to, but all of a sudden, God says, I am going to dwell among you. He could have done anything. But he said, I'm coming down, and I'm going to dwell among you. But I am not going to just dwell among you in any old way. I choose to dwell among you, but I choose to do it by a tabernacle. Well, this will have greater significance when we get down the road here because we are the temple of God. He was the tabernacle of God. And God wants to dwell among us by tabernacling in us living in, in the temple, actually, because this is not Solomon's, I mean, this is not Moses' tabernacle that we've become. We've become the temple, the very temple, and that's God's heart to dwell among us in that manner. All right. <clears throat> um, uh, for Israel, everything changed. When, they, when he set up the tabernacle, everything changed. Everything changed. God was no longer looked upon as one who was far away but could be found in the earth. Jesus is laying forth these same concepts to his own disciples, but the implications are far more reaching than what happened to Israel in the wilderness. By functioning as the tabernacle of God, Jesus has brought God down, not just to dwell among us, but in us. Amen. That's what he wants to do. That's the revelation of this. To not just to dwell among us, but in us. We're the temple. Jesus is the tabernacle, and he's dwelling in him, not just with him. <clears throat> All right, so, um, <clears throat> but before that truth can become established among those who will one day be God's temple, because he's talking to the disciples that will one day, but they're not now. They're just people. They're just God's people. They're not, the, they're not living as the temple of God. <clears throat> so before that truth can become established among those who will one day be God's temple, he must first show the pattern of it found in the tabernacle himself, just as God did with Israel. God set up Moses' tabernacle first, and it was there for years and years and years until they finally, and when God finally introduced Solomon's temple, it was on a grander scale and a greater reality. Well, all that still shadows. Jesus tabernacled among us long enough to show us not just the not just to teach us teachings, but to show us this is how you're going to live. I'm the tabernacle, but there's going to be something greater. And, and anybody remember any of the scriptures that we just read when we started this in John 14? Uh, we'll get into it. Um, but he says, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do, and greater works than these shall he also do, because I go unto the Father. What's going on here? I've heard those scriptures quoted a million times in a million perverted ways. It's, everybody thinks, well, we're going to do bigger miracles. That's the way I've always heard that thing. But he's talking about, you think the tabernacle of Moses was great and glorious. Where do you see this temple and its building? It's going to be glorious. The tabernacle is talking to the people who will become the temple. And he's saying, I'm the model. I'm the model. Look at me. Listen to me. Pay attention. Just like God was talking to Israel. Look at this. Pay attention. When this built, they're supposed to go, oh, my God. And they did, but not for the right reasons. It was all a shadow. <clears throat> all right. So... Um, let's see. God did, uh, God did not start by introducing the people, of uh, the temple to his people. He started by introducing the tabernacle. I'm talking history now. Remember the, the chart runs the historical, uh, what, what are we called? The historical presenting of the house of God and then the spiritual reality. The historical reality, he didn't start by showing them the temple. He started by showing them the tabernacle. The, the same principle works. This is a tempor temporary tent that God will dwell in. 
this is a permanent structure that God will dwell in. Okay? I know I'm hitting you with a lot right now, but, you know, there's a lot to this. My Lord, there's a lot to this. I mean, there's a lot right here in this 14th chapter. <clears throat> All right, so God, God didn't start by introducing the temple to his people. That came much later, but the basic blueprint was given to them first in the tabernacle. And the greatest thing for these disciples to grasp at the moment was how a tabernacle of God should function. The, he's not really telling them at this very moment, he's not telling them you're going to be a temple. He's showing them how a tabernacle functions and that that same principle will be applied to you when you become the temple of God. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'll read that part again. The greatest thing for these disciples to grasp at the moment, at this moment, was how a tabernacle of God should function. Because if they can see it in Jesus as our example and as the model, they will comprehend it when they become the temple of God. All right. Um, in verse 10, it says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Okay, in verse 10, the Lord gives them the basic premise for functioning. Here's the basic premise for functioning by speaking these words. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? This is the basic premise, whether it's tabernacle or temple. Do you believe that the Father's in me and I'm in him? Okay? This is not meant to be a theological statement made by the Lord. I reiterate that this is his introductory statement as to how the tabernacle of God functions and how the temple of God will also one day function. Whatever he's saying is now true of him and will one day be true of us in, in the resurrection. <clears throat> the premise he sets forth is that you are to contain the life of God. That's not hard, is it? <laughs> That's the premise. You're supposed to contain the life of God. That means that as God's house, you are a container while the inhabitant, God, is the initiator. All right. Now, while that, while that may not be so obvious in the first part of verse 10, it becomes plain that this is his meaning in the rest of the verses. Jesus continues by saying, The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Now, listen to this, because we, I've heard this, his words misinterpreted so many times here. <clears throat> um, in other words, Jesus is not speaking about himself except as the container of the one he really uh, he is really speaking concerning the Father who dwells in him. I've heard people say, uh, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, saying, okay, Jesus is not going to speak about himself, he's going to speak about the Father, and that is true. But in this context, he's saying, look, I'm not the initiator. I'm the tabernacle of God. God is dwelling in me. He doeth the works. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about him. What you've been seeing is him. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't about me. But we, and they're always going, well, you know, show us. And he's going, I'm showing you right now. This is him. Yes. Is that mean, does that mean that, like, all the things, like, things that he did, like feeding the multitudes and everything, like he's saying right here that that was my father in me. Yeah. Well, Ultimately, yes, that was, that was the truth. I mean, I've heard people say uh, that the miracles proved that Jesus was God. But Jesus himself said, <clears throat> the works that I do are not my own, they're the Father's. It proved he was the tabernacle of God. Does that mean he's not God? No, of course not. You know, he said, I and the Father are one. What the, what, what the son seeth the father do, that he doeth, and, you know, by that oneness. <clears throat> but that wasn't a proof that, that he was God. It was a proof that he had God in him. And that was really the, the work that he came to do. I mean, he says that. Yes. So really also, you think Jesus is as Jesus, until he's hanging on the 
cross and his father were sick. Yeah. And up to that point, it was all the father. Right. Like all the red letters in our mm. Bible, it's not Jesus' words. They're the father's words. Mm. You mean all of these words? <coughs> all right. So, um, <coughs> let's see. Now, while that may not be so, let's see, I, I got into that. Let's see. In other words, Jesus is not speaking about himself as the, uh, except as the container of the one he is really speaking concerning the Father who dwells in him. To prove this, Jesus finishes his sentence with, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Meaning, he's not just saying, I'm not, gonna, I'm not speaking of myself, I'm only speaking of him as if this is some sort of humble thing. He's saying, I am the tabernacle of God, and I'm not speaking about me. I'm not doing this. He doeth the works. You see the, how the context fulfills the, the very meaning of what he's saying. <clears throat> um, notice the emphasis on the location, uh, because he says, uh, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The location is important. <clears throat> the location the, of the Father. The Father dwelleth in me. So we understand that the tabernacle of God is not doing the works, but the God who inhabits the, the, the tabernacle does so. All right. I like this next paragraph. So let's review a little. <laughs> so let's review a little bit before we move on. Philip wanted to know and see the Father, right? That's what we've been reading. Philip wanted to know and see the Father. Since Jesus came as the tent of God or as his habitation, he is taken aback by the fact that his disciple does not understand that it is the Father that it is at work through him. To meet the vessel is to meet the one who lives, <coughs> the one who lives within. <coughs> All right, verse 10, Jesus makes this statement. Believest thou not that... Okay, now this is real important because the Lord is... He's been talking about principles. Now he's going to start talking about what we're supposed to believe. Okay. He's been showing principles. Now he's going to put it in terms of this is our belief system. Tabernacle. I'm tabernacle. You temple. This is what we believe. <laughs> okay. Uh, Believest thou not that the Father is in me? He follows that up with telling him that the one of whom he speaks is not himself, but the Father that dwelleth in him. And the thing he is trying to explain about the one who inhabits him is that he's doing the works, meaning that all action that proceed forth from Jesus should not be attributed to him, but to the indwelling Father. In explaining these things, Jesus has effectively shown them the new manner in which God will function with his people because he's come to dwell among us to tabernacle among us, to live within us. Is that, that's, that's his purpose. That's his complete desire. And David saw that desire and said, oh my God, we need to build a temple. This tent stuff ain't going to hack it. Because it's bigger than just one person having that. <clears throat> All right. Um, All right. This was the introduction of the reality God had in mind when in shadow form he introduced the tabernacle to Israel in the wilderness. It was necessary to recover, to recover the ground that has already been addressed so that it might prepare us for the next verse. In verse 12, Jesus says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. All right, that verse right there I've heard interpreted so many different ways. In this, verse, uh, the, in this verse, the Lord is pointing back to two important aspects that he has previously set forth in the verses before this one. So what I just said with that is he's going to keep it within the context of what he's already said within verses just in front of this. Don't let that word context fool you. <laughs> he's... He is not saying, like what most people do, they pull this out and they apply it to something in another book or somewhere else or something else. And he's saying, I'm staying in the context of what I'm talking about here. So he's talking about these works. Um, <clears throat> let me 
make sure I got it. In this verse, the Lord is pointing back to two important aspects that he has previously set forth in the verses before this one. The first aspect pertains to believe. It has to do with what they believe and therefore runs more along the lines of theological acceptance, meaning what he has said in relationship to believe is what we are supposed to accept as our theology pertaining to God. We're, we don't just see the word believe and apply that to salvation believing. He's not talking about salvation believing or for miracles. He's not talking about, he's talking about how to function as a tabernacle and as a temple. And he's specifically outlining theology or a, or a better way of saying it, a belief system that we're all supposed to hold. And this is Jesus Christ talking to disciples about a belief system that he's telling us to, we should embrace. <clears throat> all right. Um, what he wants them to embrace as part of their belief system involves the concept of it being possible to live somewhere else while someone else lives in you as described by the phrase, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Because we claim that we live in Christ and Christ lives in us. But that's not supposed to just be a theological concept. It is supposed to be a belief system that we live by whereby that is true within us. Um, Jesus as the pattern, as seen in the, uh, uh, in the mount, remember, God told Moses, make everything pertaining to this tabernacle according to what you've seen in the mount, meaning in the heavens. You m make sure that you don't just build something according to what you think. Build it according to the heavens. Eternal reality, okay? <clears throat> um, Jesus, as the pattern, as seen in the mount, is laying forth the pattern of the true tabernacle in preparation for the erection of the temple that will take place when Jesus rises from the dead. And I've got, you don't have to turn there, but I've got a scripture that I want to read. Let's see. I'll just read it for you so we don't have to take all that much time. <clears throat> Jesus, uh, book of Hebrews says, who serve unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. Okay. And so um, there is, Jesus is representing that pattern. And he is from God and he is living He's, he's living reality. He's not doctrine, but he's telling them, you must grasp this or you'll never be the temple. What is the, what is the danger? Well, if you don't grasp this, you will call yourself the temple based on theology and not be my habitation. You'll be living in there like we discussed Song of Solomon, the Shulamite, living in there. Well, like we discussed David saying, who's going to live in God's tent? Well, God is supposed to. And you will call yourself the temple of God, but you will not be the temple of God. And that's what Jesus is trying to avoid here. I mean, these scriptures, folks, this stuff is for us. This is for us. This is how we find the mind of the Lord. You don't just listen to me or some other teacher. You know, I mean, if, if I'm out there and I'm listening to somebody going over this, then I, I must feel the gravity of what Jesus is saying, not me, and say, Lord, open my eyes to John 14 because I need to see what the tabernacle is saying to those who will become the temple because he's the template. And how shall we ever be built correctly if we don't build according to what we've seen in the mount? And that's what Hebrews is talking about. Isn't it funny? It's well, it is. It's quote, and it's quoting all of that, but it's talking to us today. And, uh, you know, and let me just say this. I, I do comprehend that, 
you know, you're not going to get everything I'm saying here. I'm not, I'm not even hoping that you'll get everything I'm saying here. I'm hoping that something stirs within us that we begin to truly see this contrast of the two and quit praying that, oh, Jesus, show up, you know, as the tabernacle of God. Oh, Jesus, show up in our meetings. Oh, Jesus, you know, Jesus is here, folks. He's living in us. If he's going to show up, you're going to have to die. Get out of the way. Let Jesus show up, you know. And, you know, I, w you know, my, I wish Jesus would show up on my job. Well, I wish he would, too. Don't you think about bringing him? <laughs> you know, you know, or I wish you, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, we're the temple of God. You know, I don't know about that person on, on the job. I don't know about that person, but I know about us. We're the temple of God. And if God's going to show up at all, we can quit praying to a God that's far away. That's what he was no longer far away in the historical reality when he said, I'm going to set up a tabernacle and dwell among you. Dark shadow that it is, very dark, but it revolutionized Israel. Living reality, not dark shadow. Jesus came and dwelt among us, not just so that we could have three and a half years of glory. I mean, doesn't it seem like a ripoff? It's been 2,000 years since that happened, and those guys only got him for three and a half years. I, mean, I don't know where you come from, but I'd call that a ripoff. I'm not jealous over them. They only had him for three and a half years. But what's everybody doing? They're praying for him to come back. Well, he's here. And, and from this tabernacle, you know, how are we going to comprehend this um, if we don't hear from the very tabernacle himself the pattern and he's presenting it from heaven itself because he's from above. He's from the mount, if you will. And from there, he knows this stuff intimately. He came and is living it. He's speaking it. He's, he is breathing it. It is who he is. And when he speaks, this, but I mean, think of these guys. I mean, these are his disciples, and they've been with him a little while now. I mean, this is chapter 14, folks. This is almost the end of the road here. I mean, basically, what, we got three days left? <laughs> that's really, really, that's about all. And then he's going to die on the cross at this point. And his own disciples are going, you know, what? I haven't seen the father. What? You know? Did you have a comment or? I, no, I okay. Think that all the time we default like Philip did. Where's, where's, where's the action? Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? And Abraham believed, and that's what, that's what pleases the father is faith. Whereas in us, in my carnal self, well, I'm not going to leave Geraldine empty because I better go and do something. Yeah. But Christ can rest in me and do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know? Isn't that enough? Well, why do right. I have to do works? You know, right. why do I have to keep proving he's in there? Keep talking. Sorry, that's just, <laughs> no, 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 no. that's just what's been coming out to me all the time. Is that I keep oh, looking for the reason. works. <laughs> what was it? You could not have stopped that one. She's absolutely right, though. That's why Jesus is saying here, believest thou. And I haven't got to it yet, but there's more that he's trying to develop. Now imagine, I mean, you think this class, I mean, you're fixing to go back. You've got three days there, there about. These guys got three days before Jesus is fixing to die. And Jesus was hurrying through this. You read this 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, you know, you read through that and you go, oh my God, he's trying to shove a bunch down their throat. And you listen to me tonight and you're going, why is he trying to shove so much down our throat? You got three days. <laughs> but the truth is, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to teach you all this stuff. And, that, and he is our teacher. <clears throat> and Jesus even addresses that in the 15th and 16th chapter where he makes it plain that, you know, I must go away, that the Holy Spirit, the tabernacle must go away, that the Holy Spirit can come and show us the temple, that we're the temple. 
<clears throat> okay? And I will be the inhabitor this time, not the Father. I will dwell in you, just as he dwelt in me as the tabernacle. And, <clears throat> and so, but it doesn't stop the Lord from pouring forth because every, I mean, every jot and tittle here are seeds. They're not sprouted yet. They're not bringing forth fruit yet. They're just now being planted, you know. I mean, I remember I used to hear Bible school teachers, and they'd be, you know, all this stuff, and I'd go, how in the world they expect me to get all this, you know. And, uh, you know, even some of them would say, well, just get the tape. Get the Holy Spirit, folks. <laughs> you know, it's better than the tape. <clears throat> but, but I learned to receive those seeds. I became a parcel of ground. And I learned to let those seeds, and the, the sower wasn't even the preacher. It was my father. And he was sowing those seeds into me. And I knew that, and I, I believed that, and I embraced that. And I said, Lord, I don't comprehend any of this, or I don't get that part, or I don't, you know. And I said, but if it, and here's my prayer always, but if this is of you, and if this is coming from you, then let the seeds of it come in me, and let the Holy Spirit bring them forth in his due season when I'm ready, because I wasn't ready for most of it. I, you know, I barely knew goo goo dad da, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I love you. You know, he is uh, wanting you to accept that on the basis of being a, 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 a on the basis of being good ground, because he said he sowed seed into good ground. He didn't say good ground automatically sprung up. That takes a while, and depending on what kind of seeds, you know, if it's some some red oak seeds, well may take a thousand years, you know, but he's going to bring forth those things. And then, and from that, I have glorious, I, I mean, I can give you a glorious testimony that so many times, years later, something would come up and I would just be searching the scriptures and I would go, oh, this is what they were talking about. And I remember thinking, I never could have got that thing. I was so, you know what I mean? Because it's like it's like a big, you know, I've used this example recently. It's like a big eight billion piece puzzle, and he gives you one piece in the middle where there's no other pieces, and you set it in there and you go, What the heck is that? You know? Maybe I need to you know, you start angling yourself and walking around it and you know. I don't get it, you know what I mean? But with time as other pieces are put in, you go, Oh, you know. And then as more is built in, you go, oh, you know, and it's a big picture puzzle of Jesus' face. Oh, my God, it's his nose. <laughs> you know, I didn't know it's Jesus, you know, but I just saw it as a weird shape, you know. It's a weird shape you're trying to fit into me. It don't fit in me. Well, it doesn't, and, and it won't until you allow the Lord to bring Fourth fruit in his due season, you know, and he'll do it. He's faithful. And so, there, so I'm just going to say this. You should never, nobody in this room or whatever, you should never turn off when you don't get everything or anything or what. You should never turn off. I mean, just go, I mean, just be that ground, that good ground and just say, just Pour in the seeds, Lord, and 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 as you do, you know, you're, you're you're as much as in you is, you listen and you say, and you know, because I know for me, even to this day, there, you know, well, let me just use an example we can all understand. <clears throat> Have you ever read somebody's book, like? Watchman Nee or Jesse Ben Lewis or T. Austin Sparks or somebody, you know, that writes this great stuff, you know. Uh, or maybe not even them. Let's say somebody that really, you know, somebody recommended a book and you don't know the writer, okay? And so you're reading it and you go through one, one chapter and you go, I don't get anything out of that. Why'd they recommend this book? You go, and, you know, you can go three chapters and quit. But what I do 
as I say, Lord, one, one crumb from your table can keep me alive for a year. <laughs> you know how he is, because it turns to feeding 5,000, you know. And I say, just give me that one. I don't, I don't go, well, I've read five chapters and I didn't get nothing. I go, I'm going, Lord, help me. Help me see you. I know there's something here that you have for me. Same thing with different people preaching and stuff. You know, you know, there are people who really don't know much of the Lord, but they can word something just right that the Holy Spirit goes, and you can just go, oh, my God, you know, and they don't even have a clue what you got, you know. But it was like electricity. Oh, yes, but if you just turn on, what are you, a robot? just turn off, you don't get anything because you've already said, well, God can't do anything with that person because they don't know Jesus. They're too dumb and I know everything. That's not a good way to be. <laughs> you know? And not that anybody here is that way, but I was that way. Honestly, I was that way until the father said, you know, I can use a jackass and I, and I will one day. I'll use you. <clears throat> you know, but I can use anything to speak into your life. But you have to be open. If you're not open, again, that's a perfect picture, like a, like a robot or something. You turn off, everything's just like, uh, you know, what do you think about? Well, let's see, laundry. Or, or you know, you know what I'm saying. You know, my, you know how your mind can just go to something. And God has something for you. And even, and this is what I believe. See, I do that when I read the word. I've read certain places in the Bible, you know, and you're reading over here and you read something and you're not getting anything and God told you, just read. Remember, uh, Paul told Timothy, just give attention to reading. That's the Bible. He said, just read the darn thing. And I would read and I'd go, I didn't get anything. He said, I didn't tell you to get anything. I told you to read it. And he's not in that same attitude, but I'm just telling you, you know, because I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing I need because I was hard-headed. He needed to speak to me like that. You know, I didn't tell you to get something. I told you to read it. You know, and so, well, I got to get something. No, you don't got to get something. You got to let the seeds come in you. You're getting something. But you have to trust in the living God. You have to trust in your father. We call him father, but is he our father? You're my father. You know what I need. You're working on me right now. I believe, I can believe that. I can trust that the Holy Spirit is at work in me. And I, so I don't have to feel anything. I don't have to uh, get excited over anything. I don't have to see anything that makes me, you know, jump up and down. I rest in the fact that you want me to see Jesus more than I want to see him. More, more, much, much more than what I want to. And so, you know, I quit trusting in my want to. Started trusting in his want to. He really wants me to. You know, he, he wants it so bad. And I want it so bad at times. Do you understand what I mean? But not like him. He always wants it. And so, you know, the, the Bible says, uh, for, the, for the, you know, I forget the exact wordings, but for the mighty God, he, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So we go, well, praise God. I, you know, God's, you know, God doesn't take naps. I mean, that's what we get out of it, you know, something like that. Well, he's different than us. He don't, he don't take naps or whatever. No, he is, what, he, he, he's always in tune with his son. And his son is in you. And he's never going to go, you know, well, I don't care anymore. He's, he's invested his son in you. And then he, he went beyond investing his son. He um, brought you in contact with certain people that are going to emphasize that son in you so that it's going to pay off. But it's not contingent on you. It's contingent on you comprehending being a tabernacle that Christ was so that in seeing Jesus, really seeing Jesus, you and I might live in the same manner 
tabernacling, but actually be in the temple of the living God. And that's God's plan, and that's what he wants. And so I'm just saying, he neither slumbers nor sleeps because he has invested himself in you. You, you know, and then just, I mean, like tonight or any other time, but I mean, you could have been anywhere. You know what I mean? I mean, you could have not been born to her and, you know, been born over here and grew up, you know, as a, you know, a native in Africa or something and never heard anything, you know, and just learned to chew sugar cane or something like that, you know? You know, and you don't have a clue what's going on, but God had you come out of her and had this contact and then spreading and it's all about Christ now. It's not about religion and it's not about learning deep I want to use a word but it's not about learning deep junk that makes us feel spiritual. It's about an increase of Christ in every seed that goes forth by me or anybody else around here and by people that don't even know the Lord. And say something and you just go oh my god you know because you're walking with the holy spirit who jesus said i'm going to send you one i'm going to send you one and he will teach you me he will take what's mine and he'll show it unto you he'll never give up he'll always be with you he will never leave you or forsake you and his one joy in life is to reveal me, the Son. And, and if you tap into that, if you just ignore it and you go, well, I got the Holy Spirit. You know, theologically, I know I got the Holy Spirit. Well, do you ever walk with him? Do you ever commune? Do you ever plug into him and go, you know, especially every moment where, where you're just going, you know, you know, I love you, Holy Spirit, because you lift up Jesus and you are so pure in the way that you do it. And so... You know, you get into situ. You know, you go to a conference and you're going, "Oh yes, Holy Spirit." I'm not talking about a conference. I'm talking about bad circumstances, or I'm talking about a teacher that doesn't know anything. You know, about the Lord, and you're saying, "You know, Holy Spirit, teach me Christ." I know you want to. I know you're. I know you're chomping at the bit to open Christ to me, to open either the Word or open my heart to the seeds of the Word that you've already put within me. I mean, I've been, I've been in places where I didn't have a Bible. And um, my comment to him was, you said thy word, I, I hid in my heart that I might not send it. Well, the word's in my heart, and I don't even know what scripture, I don't have a Bible. Bring something of the word to my remembrance that I may know Christ. And this, you know, and it doesn't always happen, but every once in a while he'll just just pop up and it'll be the most glorious thing because it was all pure. I don't have religion around me. I don't have a Bible. I'm not in a religious setting. I'm just, I'm just me in a situation where I, you know, I'm at a doctor's office for five hours in the waiting room and I forgot to bring my Bible or something. You know what I mean? And you're just going, this is either going to be a waste or I'm going to get the Lord and this is the perfect time to do it. You know what I'm saying? And so you know, then he starts sharing with you. You go, oh my God go up to the desk, can I borrow a pen and paper? You know? <laughs> you know? But if you don't, if you don't do that, do you believe, you know, he's always going to just be right there to sh be there showing you? No. He's there to show you, but he won't always be showing you unless you have that faith and that heart that says, I'm trusting you, Holy Spirit, to guide me into all truth concerning Christ. And, and you do it all the time. You just build that relationship with him. Well, the advantage of that is if you don't get a class, you know what I mean? I mean, something's going forward and you're not really getting the fullness of that. You've got the Holy Spirit and you also got the seeds. And, and, and then there's hope that goes along with expectation. Expectation. I am expecting this to come up as fruit and life on the inside of me. stuff, you know, when I was 23 years old and later gray hair and all this kind of stuff, and I've had the Lord bring something to my remembrance and just show me something and open the word 
gloriously. And while he was doing it, that remembrance, like a fragrance, would just flow over me, and I go, and I could, my mind went back to that young guy that didn't really know anything, still doesn't, but didn't know anything then. And, uh, and I remember the prayer of my heart, and I said, Lord, I really don't know what this means. I don't understand these scriptures, and I know they pertain to you, and I can't see it at all. And please, in your timing, this is the way I talk, you know, in your timing, when you think I'm ready, when you are got it all, it all converges, then open my eyes, and I'm sitting there drinking of that well and thinking, oh, you never forgot. You never forgot. I prayed that so long ago, and you've never forgotten that prayer. I'm just, you know, you just love him, love on him so much. So anyway, you probably don't have my, we're way past time. Four minutes. Well, praise God. Um, so I just say that uh, this stuff really is amazing here in John 14. And I'm messing it up because I'm having to rush so much, but I have no choice. We'll never cover it if I don't. But if we do, even if I'm rushing, the seeds are there. But if I don't do it, there's less seed, you know. And so I'm trusting the Lord in, in going through this like I'm doing it, that it's not based on this class or me as the teacher. It's based on the Holy Spirit as your teacher, and he will bring to remembrance all things that Jesus has said unto you. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the, for the hope that we have and the expectation based on the Holy Spirit's heart to lift up Jesus, that he is always ready, he is always wanting to, and that even if we're not in the mood, when if he should move and if we should become open so that he could move, the, the chains that would come over us when we weren't in the mood, but all of a sudden we start seeing you. Um, Lord, let it, let it happen often in our lives. Let the tenor of our heart always lean, lean toward the Holy Spirit because that's the only way Jesus will ever really, really know you. Not by man and teachers, not by me or anyone else. No matter how good we've seen you, Jesus. Each person has to hear this from the Holy Spirit. So we, we go away from here not necessarily full of knowledge, but with a renewed faith that Holy Spirit, nothing will fall to the ground. Nothing is wasted. That it's all gathering in towards the fullness of Christ. Bless this and all the word that goes forth in this place. And let us always walk in a spirit of faith towards you, in Jesus' name, amen.